Today's sermon is entitled, Jesusnomics. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for this uh, wonderful Sabbath that we have. As we look into your word, please send your Holy Spirit. Guide us and lead us and teach us. May we have a humble spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. I just finished a one-month-long evangelistic series in Nicaragua. Does everybody know where Nicaragua is? Central America. Yeah. I was about to go home to Hawaii. At the time, my home was Hawaii. Not anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. You would think that I would be letting out a sigh of relief. Whew, that was long. I finished. There was baptism. Praise the Lord. Whew, right? But I was very nervous. Nervous than ever, never before. And... I was in Nicaragua about a one month without a limited, uh, without uh, much internet, it was very limited with internet, uh, limited with phone access. So I didn't really tell everybody, anyone, what was going on. I, I made a decision in Nicaragua, a very important decision. That decision was to propose to my now wife. <laughs> and... I came up with the perfect plan while I was in Nicaragua. Uh, in fact, I had a plan A, plan B, and a plan C. I wanted to make sure that if it, one, one of them goes wrong, that I would do uh, something else. And I was about to execute one of the plans. Uh, for about a month, I planned, scrapped the plan, replanned uh, over and over again until I came up with the perfect plan. The travel back to Hawaii was from Nicaragua was about 30 hours, uh, multiple plane rides. Uh, after lining up in, on many lines, uh, my first airplane was canceled for 14 hours. <laughs> so that was a long, long trip. And finally, I was on the final plane, and I was about to land. About a month ago, before I was land, a month ago, I uh, promised with Ali, or Ali promised me that she would pick me up at the airport. Uh, and she knew exactly when I was going to arrive. Um, and I would admit that my plan now, with my temperament, uh, I'm more of an introvert than an extrovert. What am I doing up here, right, as an introvert? <laughs> I'm more of an introvert than an extrovert. So uh, the plan that I came up with, the plan A, was maybe a little bit too bold for my temperament. But back then, I had to travel. I had a travel guitar, like a small guitar. I don't know if you guys know, like a Martin Mini. I don't know if you know that guitar, a very small guitar. I love to play guitar a lot. So I had that. I was going to, um, uh, when, when I reunited with Ali, I was going to get on one knee, swing over my guitar, and serenade her. Uh, that was my plan. A simple, but I thought effective. Um, what was I thinking, right? <laughs> and in my mind, my imagination was running wild in the airplane. Like, I'm going to do this and that. And uh, I would run, you know, towards Alley uh, in slow motion. For some reason in my mind, I was in a flower field and... Uh, background music was playing, la, 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 pretty cheesy, but, and then I got on one knee, played her favorite song, and Ali sheds tears of joy, of course, and uh, I would say, will you marry me? That was my plan, wonderful plan, it was a perfect plan, and as I was imagining all of this in my, in my, in my mind, the pilot voice came on, and I was drawn back to reality. He said, we are going to land in about 10 minutes. Please fasten your seat belts. And I looked out the window. The ground is getting closer. In just 10 more minutes, I could meet. I will meet. I will see again the love of my life. I couldn't wait. I start, my heart started to pound as I thought, I'm going to propose, I'm going to propose. And then my hands, today is very dry, but my hands were getting clammy. Oh, almost there. I can't wait. I waited 
a whole month for this moment. Can't wait. I saw the ground get closer, even closer. And as the plane landed, I felt the tires touch. Right. And then the, the plane stopped. The seatbelt light went off. I jumped up very quickly, and I wanted to run out, but everybody else jumped up. So I was like, hurry up, hurry up. I need to get out. And then slowly but surely, the line moved forward, and then I saw the opening, and I felt the humid air uh, hit my face. And finally, I was outside the plane. I was walking very quickly like an Olympian, and then I got to the baggage claim. And I was uh, sticking my neck up like a, a giraffe. You know, Where, where's Allie? Where's Allie? She's not, she's not here. Last time I came back to Hawaii, she was right around there. Well, I wonder what happened. Where is she? She wasn't there. So I grabbed my bags. Maybe she's waiting outside to surprise me or something. And I went outside, looked down that way, looked down. What? Where is she? I, so I turned on my phone. I got a signal. I sent a, a message to Ali. And this is what I said. Hey, where are you? I'm here at the airport. And she said immediately, you know, within a few seconds, she said, oh, you arrived? Okay, I'm going to leave right now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right now? Uh, at that point, my, my mood tur- not turned from romantic to a little bit annoyed. <laughs> and, uh, and then um, about an hour later, she arrived uh, at the airport. And my whole plan, plan A, was ruined. Uh, I was happy to see Ali again, of course, but, you know, she drove up. I can't, you know, she, she's in the car. I can't, like, I can't do the plan anymore. I can't get on one knee and, oh, man. So I got in the car and uh, 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 we, we drove off. Um, eventually, I proposed, you know, plan B didn't work, plan C didn't work either. So I had to come up with a plan D. So. <laughs> uh, but, well, that story is for another time. But um, the anticipation can you imagine if a whole, whole year, not a whole year, whole month, I was waiting for that very moment. And in the Bible, we find a group of people also waiting with a similar uh, anticipation, a similar intensity. Of course, a little bit different. Mine was a romantic uh, uh, anticipation. But in the Bible, we find a group of people waiting. The Israelites were waiting for thousands of years for the Savior. And when this man called Jesus arrived, he fit their uh, anticipation perfectly. And so many thousands of people followed Jesus up onto a, a mountain. And people's hearts were uh, exploding with uh, anticipation. What is Jesus going to do? What is he going to say? Are we going to fight the Roman Empire? What, what, is, going to, uh, what is about to happen? Everyone's imaginations were running wild just like mine was one day. As they walked behind Jesus, they were thinking, is Israel going to be rebuilt into this invincible uh, nation once again, just like we read in the scroll, a.k.a. the Old Testament? The multitude did not know what was going to happen, but they felt something is, gonna, uh, is about to happen. Something amazing is going to happen. It was this kind of environment, this kind of background, this kind of anticipation when Jesus spoke the words in Matthew chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. So let's take a look at what Jesus said during the time of Israel when they were anticipating and had a lot of emotions going on here. Uh, Are we there at Matthew chapter 5, verse 2 and 3? It says, um, well, let's read verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, those who are allowed to enter into the kingdom of heaven are those who are poor in spirit. To make it very, very short, in my own words, by being poor, you become rich. By being poor, you become rich. Write that down. By being poor, you become rich. (laughs) So let's dig a little bit deeper, starting with verse 2. What exactly did Jesus mean by blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven? In verse 2, the word of God says, Then he, meaning Jesus, opened his mouth and taught them, saying. When the Bible says Jesus opened his mouth, we can expect that something amazing 
is about to happen. When Jesus opened his mouth, those who were blind see again. When Jesus opened his mouth, those who are deaf hear again. When Jesus opened his mouth, those who are crippled walk again. When Jesus opened his mouth, those who are dead live again. When Jesus opens his mouth, something powerful happens. Because there is power in Jesus' word. There is power in God's word. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was light. It doesn't say, let there be light, and then a few million years later, it finally happened. No, when Jesus said something, it happens. Let there be light, there was light. God created a perfect and complete world with just words. And now, that very same lips was about to utter words of not creation, but re-creation. Amen. Those words explain how, can, how we can go back to the original perfect and complete world. The multitude, with great expectation, listened carefully to what Jesus was about to speak. And Jesus said, Blessed are the rich in spirit. No, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who are poor in spirit are blessed? Oh? Huh? This probably st- sounded very strange to the multitude. Those words were the exact opposite of what the teachers and leaders were teaching in those days. Yet the multitudes felt that there was something in those words that they needed and that they were seeking. Because up to this point, they were under the bondage of the rules and regulations of the religious people or the religious elites and the religious teachers. All the rules and regulations that not the Bible made up, or what the, not the Bible said, but what they made up. They were told that they were not good enough, that they were failures spiritually. They presumed that the religious elites were the only ones that had that special something, that special sauce. To make it into the, make it into heaven, only the leaders and teachers were allowed to be religious. Only the leaders and teachers were allowed to be blessed by God. Only the leaders and teachers were rich in spirit. According to them, the multitudes were poor in spirit. Those are the lies that they believed in, and were told day by day. But with the, these first words of Jesus. Jesus flipped the assumptions. Jesus said, the ones that are blessed are not all these religious teachers. The ones that are blessed are the poor in spirit. But why is that? Why are the poor in spirit blessed? You would think that the people that are very spiritual are blessed. Why is the poor in spiritual Uh, are blessed. Personally, um, I didn't really grow up in a financially well-off environment, you could say. Uh, that doesn't mean that I, I was especially struggling when I was uh, growing up in, in financial matters. Uh, you could probably say that I was financially average. average. However, when it came to spiritual things, I grew up in a very Above average uh, environment, I, I think. I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in a, uh, or I went to a Christian school. Uh, I went to church every week. Uh, my family had family worship uh, morning and night. And um, I, had, I heard all the Bible stories. And I was eventually baptized when I was 15. You could say that though I was financially poor, I was technically spiritually rich, I got more spiritual things than the average person, you would, I, I think. When I was younger, I always thought to myself in that environment, I wish I was rich to the point where I could buy whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. And since my family wasn't that well off, I thought to myself, I guess I just have to make that money. <laughs> 
So as soon as I turned 15 and a half, which was the legal working age at that time in California, I don't know if it still is, but 15 and a half, I started working. My first job was uh, gardening. I was a gardener. <laughs> then I, I worked at a restaurant. Then I worked as a parking attendant. Then I worked at a, uh, more other restaurants, uh, Vietnamese restaurant, pizza restaurant, a ramen noodle restaurant, <laughs> uh, Japanese bento restaurant, a lot of restaurants. The tips were pretty good. Uh, but one day, uh, somebody came to me and, and head, head, technically headhunted me. They saw me speaking Japanese at the Japanese restaurant and said, oh, we need somebody that speaks Japanese. And that person turned out to be a banker. So I was invited to uh, join this bank in America. It's not really known. I just found out that bank got bought out by U.S. Bank. <laughs> just uh, 2022, I, I read. I was looking for that bank. Because oh, I still have friends that work for, for that bank, but I guess they're not working anymore. I don't know. I haven't uh, contacted them. But as soon as I became a banker, I kind of became obsessed of moving up the chain. Because every time I moved up, I would get a raise and stuff like that. I moved up and moved up and moved up. And finally, I had an expensive car and I, I was able to buy whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, to a certain degree. Uh, I couldn't, you know, buy a whole island or something like that right away. But uh, I was able to buy what I wanted at that time. And I said to myself, I finally am both rich and spiritually, physically rich and spiritually rich. I have my membership in the church that is called the Remnant Church of God. And uh, uh, also, I worked at a famous uh, bank, as a Japanese bank. Famous Tokyo Mitsubishi UFJ. I don't know if you heard of it. Oh, wow. I'm, I have both the status in the spiritual world and the physical world. I am here. I have made it. Oh, what more can I ask for? I have need of nothing. Ding, 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 ding. For some, that last phrase probably rung a certain biblical bell. Uh, I didn't literally say that, but I was acting like it, right? That is because in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, if you'd like to turn to Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, um, there's a statement here. It talks about a certain group of people that was also in a similar state as I was. And if you have the New King James Version, it has a little title uh, 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 right above verse 14, Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, the lukewarm church. <laughs> it's not a really a nice uh, title, but we're going to go down to verse 17 and read what it says. It says right here, because you say, I'm rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched. Miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You think you're rich, but you're not, is basically what it's saying. These words were written to the Laodicean church. The, La the, the word Laodicea actually is actually a pretty profound word, but nowadays, especially in the Adventist church, it's like a bad word. <laughs> you're a Laodicean member or whatever. You're a Laodicean church. But it's not, it's not a bad word. It's, it's actually a very profound word. Um, but anyway, the Laodicean church did not have the self-awareness of being in the state of lacking. They were lacking, but they didn't realize it. They were physically and financially rich, of course. And they even thought that they were spiritually rich. They were citizens of a great country, and, and they were part of uh, this new faith that was rising called Christianity. What more could they ask for? And just like the little days in church, I didn't realize that I needed Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. But you said that you were a church member. Yes. It's actually possible to be a church member and not have Jesus Christ living in your heart. I didn't realize that. It's not enough to just be a church member. I had forgotten over time that I needed to have a continual living connection with Jesus Christ. So after a few years of being, you know, the top dog in my mind, <laughs> of course I wasn't. There are, you know, 
more people that were more rich and more well off than me, but I was happy with my position for, for a few years. But then my life started to spin out of control. I was promised to be promoted, but my boss gave that job to someone else. I'm like, what? <laughs> you said I had the job. And then at the same time, my social life started to be complicated. It felt like the castle that I carefully built up was crumbling away. I became depressed. Those who are poor in spirit, at the end of verse 3, let's go back to Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. The second part of this verse, the first part was, blessed are the poor in spirit. The second part, he says, for theirs, theirs meaning those who are poor in spirit, is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus here promises the kingdom of heaven to those who are poor in spirit. But what is this kingdom of heaven that Jesus is promising? Is this talking about when Jesus returns and called the second coming and he's going to take us back to heaven? Is that what it's called, talking about? It's interesting to note that in Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, where the Beatitude is also recorded, it actually doesn't say kingdom of heaven. It just says kingdom of God. There's a big difference between kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. Because heaven kind of gives you the idea that you know, heaven way, you know, up there when the second coming. But when you say kingdom of God, it actually makes it clearer what Jesus was talking about right here. According to theologians, Matthew wrote the Gospel of Matthew, um, mainly thinking about the Jewish readers. And in the culture of that time, it was not okay to say God's name out loud. So Matthew, thinking about the culture there, said, okay, I'm going to change it to kingdom of heaven. But Luke wasn't really worried about the cultural norms at that time. He just wanted accuracy. He's a physician. He wants accuracy. So that's why Luke says kingdom of God. What I'm trying to say is that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God mentioned here in the Beatitude is not the heaven that we think of immediately after where we go after the second coming. This kingdom that Jesus is talking about is what Jesus came on earth to build. That is why it says, you know, when it, not just this following verse, but many of Jesus' uh, words, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29, we'll look at that one. It says, Come to me, all you labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest. For your soul. You'll find it. it doesn't say anything about like way up in heaven. It doesn't say anything about the Roman Empire being, you know, decimated. It talks about our spiritual state. And this is just one of the verses, one of the, the sayings of Jesus. Whenever we look at Jesus, we, we find those kind of statements. Not like, let's get the Romans out of, our, out of our cities, out of our temple, blah, blah, blah. He doesn't say that. He talks to our hearts. Jesus didn't come to defeat the physical Roman Empire and rebuild another physical empire, according to the ambitions of the nation of Israel. Jesus didn't come to try to establish his authority on earthly, the earthly, uh, over the, or earthly kingdoms. He already had authority. He's the one that sets up kings, right? According to the Bible. He already had the authority. So what did Jesus come to build? Jesus came to build a kingdom, a spiritual kingdom, with God's love at its foundation. The kingdom that Jesus came to build was the kingdom of grace. According to the spirit of prophecy, that is what is called kingdom of grace. And the only people who are able to enter into the kingdom of grace are those who are poor in spirit. By the way, entering into the kingdom of grace is a prerequisite to entering into the kingdom of glory, which is the one that's in heaven. 
if you're not in the kingdom of grace, there's no way you're going to make it into the kingdom of glory. But when Jesus came, that's what he came to set up, the kingdom of grace. Then we don't have to wait till the second coming before we enter into the kingdom of God. That is a big deal, by the way, if you didn't understand. You don't have to wait to enter into the kingdom of God. We, we, we often think, oh, when is second coming? Uh, I want to get into the kingdom of heaven right away. Oh, I can't wait. You don't have to wait. Yes, we long for the second coming, of course, yes. But the kingdom of God is already open for us to walk into. A while back in Japan, my family and, ha- and I had a chihuahua, a black and white chihuahua. Very cute. But to own this chihuahua, we went to the pet store, and we carefully chose the puppy that we wanted. Uh, in Japan, we have, I don't know, if maybe you've seen it on YouTube, but we have, like, pet stores with actual pets in it. Um, <laughs> over here, you, you, you don't really see anything, but they have, like, this uh, little... Um, glass windows with all the dogs and cats you know, lined up and everything like that. So we, we walked by and all, all of the puppies and um, there was this one puppy that just looked at me and when I walked by, it came closer to the window and it was like, our, our, our eyes locked and oh, this is the one. And we made sure that there was nothing wrong with the puppy, you know, picked it up, uh, uh, made sure the temperament was okay, no serious, obvious uh, sickness, and we said, oh, we want this one, and we called the pet store person, and he meticulously, meticulously, for two hours, about two hours, <laughs> explained how to take care of the dog, and uh, he was trying to sell us dog insurance, and uh, all, all that. Two hours, can you believe that? And at the very end, he told us, but you can't take this dog. Even if you pay for it, you can't take this dog right away because this dog is not feeling well. We just want to make sure that, you know, it doesn't die on the way home. So she said, you know, put, put a down payment. If it dies, you lose your money. But, um, but we took a risk because we really liked the, liked the dog. So we put the down payment. We actually paid for the whole thing. But, and then we waited for the phone call. We waited for about a week, and there was no phone call. We couldn't wait, so we went back, drove over to the pet store, and went directly to the pup, where the puppy was. And like, oh, yep, you're still cute. Yep, you're still, you know, little tiny, tiny thing. And we decided, you know, let's let's ask the pet store person, um, you know, what's going on? Uh, why, why is it taking so long? The dog looks fine. It doesn't have a runny nose like I do right now, and uh, it's it's fine. So let's. Go talk to him. And we asked, no, is it going to take a little bit longer? And the pet store person was like very surprised. What? Wait a little, little longer. What are you talking about? <laughs> we were waiting for you to come pick it up. <laughs> what? You mean we don't have to wait anymore? No, you don't have to wait anymore. We were waiting for you to come pick it up. Like, we were a little bit surprised, but at the same time overjoyed. We don't have to wait any longer to take our little puppy home. I'm about to close here, but I want you to listen very carefully. We don't have to wait any longer to receive the joy and peace that God offers. The kingdom of grace is open to us right now. We don't have to wait. In fact, Jesus is the one that is waiting with open arms. He is waiting for us to open our hearts. We don't have to wait until we feel strong enough to meet Jesus. We don't have to wait until we feel cleansed enough to meet Jesus. We don't have to wait until we feel knowledgeable enough to meet Jesus. We don't have to wait until we feel good enough to meet Jesus. We can meet Jesus right now, today. We can meet Jesus just as we are. Of course, when we meet Jesus, he'll change us. <laughs> but we have to take that initial step to meet Jesus just as we are. Don't wait. It doesn't matter what your past was. 
It doesn't matter what your situation is right now. Even if you are weak, unpendable, powerless, even if you're feeling hopeless, it doesn't matter. Go to Jesus. If we go to Jesus, just as we are, Jesus will welcome you in. 100%. There is no time when Jesus says, well, wait a minute, you know, can you run around the church one more time and uh, then you could come? No. Every time we go to Jesus, no matter how dirty you feel, no matter how uh, sinful you might feel, He is ready to accept you. But, but I've, I've done this sin over and over and over. No, don't wait. That's Satan's uh, biggest deception, I think. Well, I'm going to ask for forgiveness after, you know, a little bit. I'm going to put a little bit of time in between just to show God that I'm, you know, a little bit sorry for what I did. No, don't do that. As soon as you recognize that you have sinned, ask for forgiveness. Satan wants you to wait. Then maybe you'll get in an accident and you, you never were able to confess that sin. That's the state that... Satan wants. Jesus doesn't want that. That's why he says, come to me. And when we go to him, he will clothe us with his righteousness and embrace you with his loving arms. It means you're able to become a part of the kingdom of grace right now. Is anybody feeling poor in spirit? Jesus will take you in. That is why by becoming poor, you become rich. I want to close with a prayer, but I also want to make an appeal. If you are spirit, but you want to be covered by the blood of Jesus, you want to enter into the kingdom of grace, I'd like you to stand up and have a word of prayer with me. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you sent your only begotten Son so that we may enter into the kingdom of grace. Amen. Father, we are all feeling short in the area of spiritual worthiness. We are not worthy, but you make us worthy. Lord, please forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings in our lives. Please fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit. Cover us with your righteousness. And may we all see you face to face on that glorious day when you come. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.